Ukraine has urged its citizens in Russia to leave immediately. It says Russian aggression is increasing and so too the threat of invasion after Moscow's recognition of two breakaway regions as independent states. In other developments, Ukraine is preparing a month-long state of emergency, according to its top security official. The Ukrainian parliament has approved a draft law allowing all Ukrainians to carry firearms and act in self-defence. And Kiev is calling up some reservists for military duty. And General Rio Teras joins us from Estonia. He was a commander in the Estonian Defence Forces, now a member of the European Parliament. Do you expect the Russian president to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine? I think it is still uh, very much possible. If we listen to his speech uh, day before yesterday, then it was the war declaration, even though on the end it uh, didn't come to it. But uh, talking about how Ukraine is not the state, uh, I think he... Uh, uh, showed that the, the the strategic aim is to change the government in Kiev, and uh, by just uh, operating in Donetsk, in Donbas, uh, he will not reach the aim of changing the government to uh, a government which is more suitable for Putin or recognizing Putin as his uh, as as the superior. Now, the Ukrainian military has issued an order to call up reservists. From a military standpoint, can Ukraine withstand a Russian offensive? Yeah, anyway, Russia has never in the, in the last decades uh, or even uh, since Second World War faced uh, an, um, an army big, uh, uh, that big as the Ukrainian. Uh, and, uh, and little Finland 1939 has showed that you can fight with, uh, with the big enemies. So I think Ukrainian army uh, and Ukrainian state is very much ready to fight for the for the values, uh, democratic values, and uh, and fight for their independence. I have seen that in the eyes of the soldiers uh, in uh, in Ukrainian uh, demarcation line uh, a couple of days ago. They want they are ready to fight for their country. Do you see a military option, or is diplomacy the only way out of this? Well, I don't think uh, Putin understands diplomacy uh, because every attempt to reach the hand uh, towards him, uh, he has not taken the peaceful hand. So uh, I don't think Putin wants a diplomatic uh, solution. Uh, if, of course, if he would do that, then it is uh, very positive. But uh, then he has to withdraw from the Donetsk and... Uh, Lugansk, where his uh, troops are right now, and give back Kiev, uh, give, give back Krim, sorry. You tweeted yesterday that bold steps are needed to put delusional Putin in his place. What are those steps? Therefore, uh, from, uh, from uh, say, uh, NATO's perspective, I would say NATO has been showing its very, very... Um, a big unity, uh, they're very focused. NATO has never been stronger. Uh, as uh, as it is right now, uh, and that is uh, caused by Putin's uh, behavior. Uh, European Union uh, has put on sanctions on, or is just about to put sanctions on on, uh, on Russian uh, Russians. Uh, again, very much unified. Even though uh, people thought that some countries will not support these sanctions, they are. So very strong sanctions, uh, and even Germany has uh, at least postponed uh, for the current moment. Uh, uh, the Nord Stream 2. Uh, so these are the these are the steps. But I am convinced that Ukraine needs a financial and uh, military uh, help. Military by military help, I mean uh, ammunition and stocks to support them. And on that front, U.S. President Biden announced yesterday he would would be sending more troops to the Baltic states, including Estonia, where you are to bolster NATO's eastern flank. How's that going to help? Uh, well, NATO is uh, determined to defend the NATO's territories. Uh, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian armed forces are, are ready to defend the territories uh, and the NATO's eastern border. And our allies, not only US, but, uh, but France, uh, Germany, Canada, Denmark and others are sending uh, additional troops to the region, understanding uh, that uh, this is... Uh, fight for, for democratic values, and Poland is ready. So uh, 
to show strengths is the only way of Putin understands, the only language Putin understands. Rio Terras, former commander of the Estonian Defence Forces, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you very much. Relations between Ukraine and Russia are at their lowest point in years. Kiev has recalled its ambassador from Moscow and is considering ending all diplomatic ties. It wasn't all that long ago that Ukraine had a pro-Russian president. Eight years ago, Vladimir Putin had a friend in Kiev, President Viktor Yanukovych. Having pro-Russia president was very important for Russia. It meant that a lot of reforms would be stalled. It meant that any union with the West would not be possible. And in 2013, when Yanukovych refused to sign an association agreement for closer ties to the EU, the people rebelled. Scores died, hundreds were injured in the Maidan revolution. Yanukovych was ousted and a new pro-EU government formed. The Kremlin answered back with tanks and annexed Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. Moscow also threw its support behind separatists in the pro-Russia Donbass region. War broke out as the two eastern provinces, Donetsk and Luhansk, declared independence. European leaders brought the two sides together for the Minsk peace accords. But the war ground to a stalemate. A development far from the battlefield also spiked tensions. In June 2015, Russia announced the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. Its route under the Baltic Sea would bypass Ukraine, meaning Kiev would lose billions in transit fees. Another turning point in 2019 was Vladimir Zelensky as Ukraine's president. He vowed to restore the Donbass region and renewed calls for NATO membership. Many leaders hint slightly that Ukraine shouldn't take the risk of talking constantly about membership of the alliance, because this risk is connected to Russia's reaction. But that was a red line for Moscow. And no one thought that if Ukraine creates such threats for Russia, it creates similar threats for herself. It was one of Putin's justifications for the Russian troop buildup around Ukraine's borders. But unlike eight years ago, Ukraine is a battle-hardened nation that's vowed to resist. Well, Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has been addressing the Russian moves against Ukraine. Here's some of what she had to say. The Russian president is trying to turn back the wheel of history in eastern Ukraine at the expense of his neighbors. With power, with military force, with absolute contempt for everything that defines the legal and peaceful order in Europe. And not least, with indifference towards the fate of the people affected on both sides. Germany's top diplomat and now our chief political correspondent, Melinda Crane. What do you make of what the foreign minister said? Well, she uh, was meeting with her French uh, colleague, uh, Foreign Minister Le Drian, and both of them were at great pains to uh, put on a very resolute display of unity. And after that statement, she went on uh, to essentially lay out the goals of the sanctions that were imposed by the EU yesterday, and which include the momentous decision by Germany to defer certification of the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia, which which will impose pain in Russia, but also some real economic uh, hardship for Germany as well. So uh, she said the goal is not simply to deter Russia from further escalation. Yes, that's important. But beyond that, it is to reinforce important norms of international law, like territorial integrity. And she went on to say, and I quote, we are ready to pay a high price for a free and sovereign Ukraine. And you know, sometimes uh, the norm of territorial integrity can sound like an abstraction, but let's listen to Chancellor Olaf Scholz of Germany explain what would happen in Europe if we simply sweep aside norms and rules that have been in place since the Second World War. If you look back far enough in history, 
you will find many borders that were different back then. If we reopen discussion on all of them, we will face very troubled times. That is why we must urgently return to this principle. State sovereignty is respected. Borders are not violated. What Putin and his parliament have decided is a breach of international law that we cannot and will not accept. So what role is Chancellor Schulz's government playing in addressing the crisis? Well, and not only Foreign Minister uh, Baerbock, but also her French uh, colleague, both said very clearly that these sanctions are simply a first stage. Both are aware that uh, there uh, could be further escalation measures by Germany, by Russia, and that they would by no means uh, necessarily only be in the form of a full invasion, but could take other forms as well. For example, a cyber attack. And yet, uh, the foreign minister, the German foreign minister and Chancellor Scholz's government as a whole have been very clear that diplomatic outreach remains a necessity. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, the fact is that uh, we have said to Russia, come back to the table. We do not accept that they have simply thrown out uh, the process of talks called the Normandy format, that they have ripped to shreds the Minsk agreement that was supposed to try to find a solution to stabilize eastern Ukraine. And nonetheless, we say we are ready to talk. And then she said in English, we said to Russia, you need to come back to the table. Would it have made any difference if she'd said it in Russian? <laughs> <laughs> Belinda Crane, thank you very much for the analysis.